Welcome to the pop-up exhibition series of the Magnus. Every week we have a speaker from campus or the community come and present new ideas in conjunction with objects or art from the Magnus collection. Uh, sometimes the connection is just uh, sort of a, a way in which two paths kind of cross with one another. Other times the, the presentation is really very much about the objects and the art that we display. Uh, we use this format to really explore new ideas and new ways to interpret the materials we have and to create communities like we do today with you. Uh, it's really my pleasure to have to welcome to our series Rebecca Goldberg. Uh, Dr. Goldberg is the executive director of the Institute for Israel Studies here at UC Berkeley, and she's an anthropologist and she's teaching about memory and the Holocaust, and she took the challenge of thinking about uh, this, what we have on display today is one of a series of uh, paintings of portraits made in Kiev in the late 1980s. So as the, as the Berlin Wall was, uh, was falling and, and the, the borders were opening up and new ideas were developing, Matvei Weisberg, the, the author of this painting, actually went back to painting core Jewish memories of the history of Ukraine by painting portraits of Jewish writers. Many of them, like Peretz Markish on display here, were Yiddish writers who were murdered under Stalin uh, in, in, uh, in the summer of 1949. Um, and uh, so reclaiming a, a, an intellectual and cultural past at a time of great transition. Uh, we acquired this painting along with, um, I think, about nine others as a gift from a, a woman who immigrated from Kiev with her husband in the 1990s to San Francisco. And uh, her family was friends with the, with the painter and they brought some of his art uh, to, to the Bay Area and eventually found a home at the Magnus for, for these works. Uh, very recently, through social media, we made contact with the author, who is now providing commentary to his works through the Flickr platform, which is a, a, an image sharing platform. So we are uh, almost Facebook friends with Michael uh, Weisberg. And it's fascinating that we can have this, this conversation across so many different barriers. Um, Matvei Weisberg and the reclaiming of a Jewish past and the present. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for joining us today. Please join me in welcoming Rebecca. I'm going to lower it a little bit. Um, so welcome. I'm very happy to have you all here. Um, and as Francesca said, I um, was given a challenge of linking in some way my own work to this exhibition, with, which was up last year. Um, I know I need to speak into the microphone. Um, and uh, making some connections. So I am not a scholar of uh, art um, or portraiture, and so really I'm going to try to contextualize uh, Matvei Weisberg's portraits of Soviet Yiddish writers um, by giving you a sense of the time and the place in which he was doing that work. Uh, I want to also point out some of the artists that, uh, and that he was painting um, we have Sholem Alechem and Osip Mandelstam and Boris Pasternak. I believe there's a little contestation about whether one of the portraits is of uh, Yosef Brodsky or of uh, David Bergelson. And then there are some members of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee who were Yiddish writers uh, and poets and who were murdered as part of the Night of the Murdered Poets in August of 1952. And I have um, a link to that a little bit later as well. Um, because, of course, there is also the fascinating issue of the opening of the archives of the former Soviet Union and access to some of that documentation that they were collecting during the, the whole period of the anti-fascist committee. So if I have time, I'll also point that out. But I want to give you a context for the art. Uh, that period in which he was writing, and I'll, I'll just quote for you from the exhibit, it has said, these unusual works, painted on cardboard in the late 1980s and based on archival photographic sources, reclaimed a suppressed cultural heritage on the eve of the fall of the Soviet Union. 
the faces of Yiddish and Russian Jewish writers emerge as spectral and partial reflections on the politics of identity in contemporary Ukraine. And so he was doing this work in the late 1980s, and so that's where I'm going to start you. Um, in that period of the late, late 1980s, or late Soviet period of glasnost and perestroika, that is, of opening and restructuring, uh, we know that that period had enormous political and economic implications for what was to come after, but that period also reshaped the social, cultural, and intellectual landscape of the late Soviet period. Um, it was very much a period of intense historical inquiry into the past and a flourishing of what I would call counter-narrative. Now, I know I'm going to get a signal that that is a kind of academic jargon, but I'm going to define that a little bit more later. But it is my sort of one academic jargon that I'm allowed here, right? <laughs> so um, there was a flourishing, that is, of those narratives that have been kind of under the table, coming out into the open, and contesting those formal Soviet official uh, dominant narratives that have been um, largely the norm for decades. I want to flag one of my favorite anthropologists who was working um, on Ukraine at this time, uh, Catherine Wanner, who documents this period of intense historical inquiry and memory work and identity claims that related to the late Soviet and post-Soviet Ukraine um, in her book, Burden of Dreams, which I'm happy to share or pass around if you want to take a look. Um, she placed special emphasis on the process of creating a national Ukrainian culture a national Ukrainian identity out of the remnants of Soviet society. And she examines the sites, she calls them sites, at which a national culture is articulated, contested, negotiated, and sometimes institutionalized into the new sort of narratives of the new state. Um, and so I mean, one of the questions, she's working on Ukraine as a whole, and sort of where did Jews fit into that picture? Wanner looks also at what she calls residual memories or counter-memories, um, this is Michel Foucault's term, that persisted and withstood the Soviet framing of history and memory. And my own work, um, while I was doing field work in Ukraine, as Francesca said, I'm an anthropologist, so rather than largely work in archives, I really um, conducted field work among, within the community there. Um, my own work delved into these same historical and cultural processes at a more micro level as they were being explored and expressed by Jewish communities in Ukraine and predominantly in places like Kiev. Um, Ukrainian Jewish historical inquiry and memory and identity claims sometimes aligned, but often ran counter to the historical and national imagination of the late Soviet and newly reviving post-Soviet Ukrainian state, as you can imagine. And some of those kind of historical sites at which there was contestation um, revolved around historical figures and historical moments. So I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, Cossack Rebellion and Bogdan Khmelnytsky of uh, late 17th century, 1648. Um, Bogdan Khmelnytsky was being reclaimed by Ukrainians as a kind of symbol of national memory and national identity as one of those independence figures at the same time that he symbolized for Jews in Ukraine a, um, you know, a tragedy, one of the worst massacres um, for Jews prior to uh, the Holocaust. And of course there's sort of the whole memorialization of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, there's a memorial to him in you know, the center of Kiev. Other historical moments included the period of Ukrainian independence following World War I, and that period of Ukrainian independence, but also civil war, um, before Ukraine became uh, part of the Soviet Republic. Uh, that moment also included all kinds of pogroms across the Ukrainian landscape. And of course, World War II and the Holocaust, um, a period in which Jewish and Soviet uh, narratives, but also Jewish and Ukrainian experiences and memories of the war largely diverged. Um, so places in which these sites become contested included history books, museums, memorials and commemorations, um, sites in which Ukrainian national culture was being negotiated, and sort of the question of where did Jews fit within that. Um, so there are sort of parallel processes of historical inquiry going on during this period of opening in the late Soviet context and also early uh, period of Ukrainian independence. Um, like Matze Weisberg, there were certainly leading intellectuals and academics and artists and writers and musicians who were playing a role in articulating and reclaiming that suppressed cultural heritage. 
um, and that they like those portraits and other writers and artists can be seen as uh, making an important contribution to this discussion. Um, so two ordinary citizens um, were also playing a role in reclaiming and reinscribing memory and identity into the cultural landscape. Um, and since I'm an anthropologist, I tend to focus on ordinary folks, young, old, different generations, but sort of not those who are necessarily elites, we would say. Um, so I want to give you a definition of counter-memories that comes out of Catherine Weiner's book, um, just so that you have a sense of what I'm talking about here. Um, individuals struggled, in her definition, individuals struggled to safeguard memories against the multitude of forces in the public sphere that attempted to shape private recollections to coincide with official historical narratives. Although denied acknowledgement in official historiography, that is the official Soviet historiography that had been held for decades, narratives of events and experiences that did not match state-sponsored accounts were often sequestered in kitchens across the country where they were passed down from generation to generation. And so I really like that image. I think it's a very relevant image if you think about what was going on in people's homes, in their kitchens, stories being passed down, grandparents who perhaps either had survived in hiding or had actually survived in ghettos or camps in Ukraine, telling those stories to their children or grandchildren, um, other aspects of Jewish practice and Jewish life. And of course, this was going on for other communities as well and for Ukrainians um, and Russians as well. Um, so those counter-memories, as soon as there was that opening up of Glasnost, um, provoked sweeping interest in historical inquiry in the final years of Soviet rule when those controls on public discourse were relaxed. And of course, these kinds of counter-memories were contested. You know, there were multiple narratives going on at the same time. Uh, for Jews, those kitchen stories that had been kept safe in the domestic sphere began to also come out in the open, relating to hidden Jewish practices, uh, relating to having um, some kinds of Jewish ritual objects in the home, even certain practices that could be considered, for example, kashrut, but no one had named them as such. Um, remember that multi-generational homes were very common, so grandparents often lived with grandchildren. Stigmatized and mixed Jewish identities, and as I noted, multi-generational transmissions of Jewish identity, memory, and stories, or narratives. Um, so in the context of my own work, I call this sort of identity work and memory work because I've looked at two different communities in the context of Ukraine, both young people but also Holocaust survivors. Um, in particular, around young people, that resurgence of interest in Jewish identity and practice and that reclaiming of a Jewish heritage certainly began in the home. Um, but it also coincided with the emergence of an array of Jewish transnational organizations on the scene in sort of really in the early 1990s, um, beginning there, you had all kinds of organs, transnational Jewish organizations coming in, Israeli organizations, you had the Sachnut or Jewish Agency for Israel, Jaffe, you had the Israeli Cultural Center setting up shop in Kiev, you had um, Eshat Torah, you had the Orthodox synagogues, you had also Hillel having a presence, um, and you also the Jewish Joint uh, Distribution Committee, JTC, and all of these organizations were particularly focused on young people as a place in which to shape the future of Jewish identity. And so you, it's, it's sort of, I, I would call it an ideological playground in many ways for shaping Ukrainian Jewish identities going forward, but also framing their uh, shaping their historical consciousness around issues like the Holocaust as well. Um, and in that context, there was uh, multiple levels of identity work going on for young people at a religious level, social, cultural, national, and also educational. There's an international Solomon University that um, emerged as well in, in Kiev. Um, young people played a very interesting role in bridging both the private and public space and the generational one. Um, in that they were learning about being Jewish at home or piecing together fragments of what they had learned at home and connecting them with what they were learning in the public sphere in all of these Jewish organizations. And they were also taking what had been transmitted by their grandparents and to some degree parents, generational, although the parents' generation was much more silent, um, 
and bridging what they were learning in the community and bringing it back home into, you know, so beginning to celebrate Shabbat, reintroducing certain rituals and traditions. So there's a fascinating bridge going on, um, both between private and public, and generationally between grandparents in particular and, and youth. Uh, in terms of Holocaust survivors, um, especially once you moved into the provinces where there were still communities of survivors um, um, living, um, there's a, a flourishing of what I would call memorial work going on in response to uh, decades of silence, really, on um, the Soviet history of more the suppression of memorialization and commemoration um, and the suppression of Jewish memory of suffering during the Holocaust. Um, and that also that very strong conflation of Jewish and Soviet experience during World War II. So that um, when the Soviet, the Soviet uh, uh, system built memorials, war memorials, for example, um, at Holocaust sites, they might say, um, peaceful Soviet citizens perished here, or they might say victims of fascism, but very almost always there were no markers of the Jewish experience the particularism of Jewish uh, suffering at those sites, or even a, an accurate accounting of who perished there. Um, and so that memorial work was really a, um, uh, an attempt to re-inscribe uh, the particularism that concrete Jewish wartime experiences onto the Ukrainian landscape. And to a large extent, that work was being done by local associations of ghetto and camp survivors. Um, and there were, two, there were a couple of motivations. One was compensation from, because once um, uh, the uh, claims, once the Soviet Union began to crumble, the, the different states, including Ukraine, allowed um, compensation um, to Holocaust survivors. These were initially one-time payouts, and then there were also those who were able to get some kind of pension. But they had to document their experience during the war, so there was a going back into the archives to look for documentation, um, and there were also collective reinforcement of narratives going on among communities of survivors, and there were often sort of leaders who took initiative in collecting those narratives and playing a significant role in gathering that documentation for communities of survivors in, in areas where there were ghettos and camps. Um, places like Bershid or Tulchin or Mogilev Podolsky or survivors of Pechora. So these are sites where the Holocaust had very um, specifically taken place on Ukrainian soil and some of that under Romanian occupation as well in the areas that I was doing research. Um, so as I said, there was a gathering of documentation for survivor compensation, but at the same time there was also a uh, push to construct memorials at Holocaust sites in places where there has been um, an erasure of memory. Um, either that the memorials were inaccurate, so for example, the camp that I have done some research on called Pechora in central Ukraine, in the Vinitsa region, had it a plaque that was inaccurate that didn't even mention that this was a site that Jews were deported to. And so reinscribing those plaques, but also creating memorials where there had been none, or where there had perhaps been a, a memorial constructed clandestinely earlier in the 60s or 70s. So constructing memorials and gathering for commemorations. Commemorations which in earlier periods had been clandestine gatherings, and now were becoming more public. So these are all part of that sort of late 1980s and early 1900s, that period of um, opening allowed this kind of memorial work and, an, and identity work to, to begin to flourish. Um, and I wanted to point to some other examples beyond this and beyond the work of Matvey Weisberg. When I was doing my fieldwork in Ukraine, I was affiliated with uh, a very small institute, it was more like, um, not part of a university, but it's called Institute for Jewish Studies or Institute Judaiki. Um, and their goals, they had gathered some academics and artists together, and they were um, both looking in archives, trying to create historical publications and also Jewish literary publications and revived those on a range of topics that were relevant to the Ukrainian Jewish experience. So they were also kind of an, an institute that emerged in the early 1990s um, in response to this, uh, this kind of historical inquiry and artistic and cultural inquiry going, going, going on. I also wanted to point you to a photographer that I got to know while I was doing work who was also affiliated with the institute. 
um, Rita Ostrowska, and her work, her photographs in particular, are a commentary on the small town world of Ukrainian Jews that I began to discover around the issue of Holocaust memory. Um, but she was documenting the shtetls, Jewish cemeteries, Holocaust sites, the old and young Jews that were still in these provincial towns, um, the Jewish practices that had been preserved, for example, making matzah on Passover that she discovered in some of these small towns, and also the, um, the impact of migration, both migration out of these small towns into cities like Kiev, and the migration beyond to places like Israel and Germany and the United States. So I want to take a moment, so now I have to figure out my technology. Um, and let's see, that didn't quite, uh, I know what I did. So um, let's see, I want to escape, but there we go. Okay, so this is just the, um, so it didn't come up, huh, on the screen. So that was supposed to come up on your screen as well, so I could point out some things. So I, so I know this is um, in small print, but I wanted to just point out, for example, the uh, Judaic Institute where I have been affiliated, and clearly they have evolved tremendously even since then. Um, and I wanted to point out the kind of work, so parallel to artists like Matvey Weisberg, um, this is the kind of, I would say, publication and literary efforts that were going on. And so if you look at their publishing activities, um, it's a little hard to see, but here there are translations going on of well-known uh, scholars of the Holocaust from the United States and elsewhere. So John Roth, actually, who we just had a couple of months ago through the Berkeley Institute. Um, there are all kinds of essays on the history of Jews and the Holocaust, the history of Jews in Ukraine. But there's a kind of real attempt at kind of creating a new historiography um, and re-examining um, re Jewish history and Jewish culture that are going on here. Um, Michal Mitzel, who was actually also affiliated with them uh, and now at the Joint Archives. But so there were, it included translations, it included historical work. It also included um, figuring out what was in the archives. Um, so um, let me just see if I can click on this. This is an attempt to figure out what's in the archives, descriptions of Jewish funds and materials in the archives of Ukraine for historians, for others coming in and doing research on the Holocaust in Western Ukraine, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the one other thing I wanted to point out from this site, um, sorry, um, is, um, they embarked from the very beginning on uh, an artistic public, they called it, and these are how the amusements of sort of translating between Russian and Ukrainian and, and English, but artistic publicist almanac, Yugubitz. And Yugubitz was, was based on what they said is the, um, was the literary term Sholom Alechem used for Kiev, for um, Kiev in his work. And again, Sholem Alechem is one of the artists that um, Matvey Weisberg had um, painted. And in this Yugubitz, they, um, first of all, I'll point out, um, in their very first publication, they um, published the work of Ivan Juba, who was a, a Ukrainian writer um, who spoke at Babiar in 1966, um, this sort of first kind of very open uh, commemoration uh, on the 25th anniversary of Babiar, which is this sort of uh, most symbolic uh, site of uh, Ukrainian Jewish loss uh, on the outskirts of Kiev. Um, and then I also wanted to point out in their second publication of Yugubitz, because they included artists here as well. You also have in that um, publication some prose, some literature, but also fine art, including Matvey Weiss, 
So um, there's sort of a link between sort of artists and writers and, and um, historians and academics in this sort of period of time to redefine Ukrainian Jewish identity and culture and history and the like. Um, so I wanted to spend a moment also showing you um, some of the work of Rita Ostrovska during the same time period. Um, so again, this work, as you can see, if I'm, if I'm working on a map, which I don't normally do. Um, if you look, Jews in Ukraine in the shuttles from 1989 to 2001. And um, so her work is a kind of documenting, it's somewhat nostalgic, documenting uh, sites, but this is a Jewish cemetery in Sharbarad, um, a small narrow street um, among very much traditional Jewish homes also in Sharbarad, and the community that was still there um, in 1989, 1990. Um, so again, it's a kind of a mirror of sort of the painting the Matthew Weisberg that focused on, on a Jewish elite that had perished, and here we have some photographs of, of Jewish community uh, in smaller towns and sort of what the community looked like in late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, this is in Kremenitz. And Shargard, what, a, what a, a Jewish home, a shtetl look, home looked like um, in Shargard. I'm sorry? Uh -huh. Sorry. You, can you want to ask me afterwards and then I'm happy to respond. So this was also making matzah before Passover in Tulchin, which is a tradition that I don't think anybody would have really been thinking about had been preserved, but it was in a small town like this. And my guess is that it either was continuing to happen clandestinely over the decades um, in people's homes, and here it is again a little bit more open. Um, Tamashpol, which is another shuttle town. And this is in Beershed. Um, and this is uh, also in Beershed right before departure, which means before immigration. So again, this is one million Jews headed toward Israel and also elsewhere, including Germany and the US. Um, just showing you a little bit more in terms of I've already seen those. I see that. In one second, because I wanted to show you, she um, has also done photographs um, after 10 years, she said. So a decade later, what these communities look like. Again, Sharbrid and Chernivtsi, which is on the border of Bukovina. Uh, not graves in the cemetery in Chernivtsi. And these are in Mogilev Podolsky, where I've done some field work as well, in the synagogue. And in Bershid. And, and this is actually the last photograph I'll just note um, is um, Avram Davidovich Kaplan, who was, when I talked about the head of ghetto uh, associations, um, he was the head of the Ghetto Association in Mogadev Podolsky. Um, and I have some, I'm happy to pass around, I have some photographs, particularly in Mogadev Podolsky, where their memorial work went beyond restoring the cemetery and restoring mass graves, but also creating almost like a shrine in their Ghetto Association house to all of the victims and survivors whose photographs they could collect. Um, but he was, and also he was uh, diligent in collecting documentation so every member of the community who was a survivor would be able to get compensation. But, um, so there's, that's her photograph. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. What the other images I wanted to show you were just to point out that, again, Matt Weisberg's uh, drawings include, his paintings included some paintings of members of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. Um, of whom obviously there had been silence uh, in terms of Soviet historiography. And um, today, the archive, the records of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee um, are in the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum from 2011. I think they received them, the whole collection, with all of the materials, the materials that became part of the suppressed black book, 
um, of Soviet Jewry, the documented atrocities during the war, um, but also all kinds of other materials from their almanac as well of literary um, prose and poetry to all kinds of other materials. And all of that is now, so one of the other things that was beginning um, that's something that like the Institute for Judaic Studies was working on was finding out what was in the archives and now that those archives have opened um, they are now accessible or many of them are now accessible and also have been digitized and copied into archives like Yad Vashem and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum so that's an aspect of that opening um, let me see if I can just get back to close I think I'm going to I just want to go to the screen. To the, just to that. Play some current slide. That the so that NYU they just had. Um, I won't show you the the um, image, but NYU I believe yesterday just had announced that. There's about uh, 2.3 million in gift to focus on the history of Soviet Jews um, in like a seven-year project. So going from lack of knowledge as Matvey Weisberg is responding to where Soviet Jewish history has been completely suppressed to um, you know, a, a huge gift to focus based on archives and other materials on the entire history of Soviet Jewry is, is a kind of fascinating leap, I think. Um, so just to close, um, I wanted to bring up another scholar, Ruth Behar, who writes about the renewal of Jewish life in Cuba. And in talking about this same period, she calls it el periodo especial, or the special period, um, a time of reevaluating and reimagining identity and belonging in the aftermath of the Soviet collapse and in her context in the opening of Cuba to the world. And I like that, that concept of thinking of it not only in terms of place, but also time. Um, and sort of thinking about that special period for Ukrainian Jews as well in that late Soviet and post-Soviet context. And I guess one question is really whether that special period has closed for Jews in Ukraine and other post-Soviet states, given the rise of conflict with Russia and the growth of extreme nationalism. Uh, and in that context, I mean, the, the, maybe the, the silver lining might be to ask what, what the appointment of someone like Volodymyr Goritzman, who, uh, who is a Jewish um, uh, businessman, I believe, lawyer and businessman from Vinitsa in central Ukraine, who was the mayor there and has now become prime minister only last week. Um, what does that signify anything about a new period of dialogue and inquiry on difficult subjects like the Holocaust? and other contested moments of Ukrainian and Jewish history and memory. You know, what does it say about the place of Jews today in the national and historical imagination of Ukraine? So that's all I have to say. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Jewish community today in the Ukraine? 
There is. There is. How large? Oh, I, you know, I haven't looked at numbers. I haven't looked at numbers today in the article that I just read. So numbers are always contested. And when I was looking um, in the late 1990s and sort of early 2000s, um, there was a wide range from 300,000 to 500,000. Um, if you were the head of the community, still the head of the sort of Jewish Federation in Ukraine, you said this also, you said 500,000, sort of, you know, how do we count when we count everybody who claims to be Jew, who, who identifies themselves as Jewish from mixed families and the like. Um, and at that time, so numbers have certainly, people have emigrated and there have been, um, numbers have certainly dwindled. 300,000 was, I believe, like Ser Sergio de la Pergola's number. Um, based on um, census data and sort of there's all of the problematic questions about matrilineal descent versus the um, fifth point in the passport of sort of Soviet nationality and if you could evade defining yourself as Jewish and that you might and so sort of how did you count? It's pretty complicated. I think it still is today. In the article that I just read about um, Volodymyr Groisman, it was actually a higher number again, like 360,000. I'm not sure that number is accurate. And at the time when I was doing my field work in Kiev, it was about 90,000 believed to be in Kiev. Again, some of them unaffiliated, a much smaller number active, and uh, you know, both sort of halakhically Jewish from both parents and also mixed families. Um, but even that number is much, I mean, just to put it in context, if you think about the rest of Europe, if you think about the rest of Central and Eastern Europe, um, the only other country that is big, had a bigger Jewish population is Russia, uh, which was closer to rivaling France. And that number for Ukraine was closer to the, the number of British Jews, for example. Even if the numbers have dwindled, they're still much more significant as a European Jewish population than um, someplace like um, uh, potentially the Czech Republic or Hungary or elsewhere. Now Germany, its numbers again have increased because of the outflex of Russian and Ukrainian Jews to Germany. So now those numbers have grown to maybe 200,000, but it's still larger than that. Um, let me see if I can take other, other questions and then come back. Yes. Um, in thinking back to World War II, Sort of unheard of 
um, as the speaker of the of the Rada. So that and that happened, I believe, uh, last year. So that that's kind of interesting. I don't know that it changes things. Historians like um, you know, Ukrainian historians are exploring this subject, but I would say they were exploring it in a very cautious way. Um, like, you know, let's look at those moments of righteous Gentiles, let's look at what the experience of Ukrainian Jews was, and let's not tread too heavily on where there were elements of Ukrainian collaboration. Now, Holocaust, uh, you know, historians at the Holocaust Memorial Museum, others, there have been publications, Martin Dean and others, on um, collaboration and very deliberate sort of aspects of Ukrainian collaboration among um, um, uh, polizai, Ukrainian polizai, and that it was voluntary, it was not, you know, all conscripted. Um, and there are examples. I think there also is an enormous difference between Western Ukraine and, and Eastern Ukraine, those areas that had been Soviet from 1917, or sort of after the Civil War, and those areas that came under Soviet occupation in 19, 1940. Um, and then were kind of re-solidified later, and that where you have the UN and the Bandera movement and other things where there were sort of uh, death squads who were collaborating. Um, because in my own research, it's quite mixed, and there were, it's certainly in central Ukraine, um, in, under Romanian occupation, um, oftentimes Jews wouldn't have survived without Ukrainians in the villages having brought them and given them food and protected them in various ways. And that's not to say that there weren't then Ukrainian police who were guarding them in the camps and who were ruthless, but at the same time ordinary villagers, um, maybe witnesses, bystanders, but at times were also aiding them, um, and very much so. So it's a mixed picture. Um, yes, and then I'll come back to Francesco. Go ahead, Kate. I just, uh, uh, I was going to ask that question and I wanted to know, did the Ukrainians admit to Babi Yar? Did they all learn about Babi Yar? And oh, everyone learns about Babi Yar. The question is how you, how you define whose memory Babi Yar signifies, because Babi Yar was symbolic of the Holocaust. Um, and there were commemorations there in 1966 and other periods, but at the same time there was, it's a much more complicated story, but there was also a deliberate, on the part of the Soviet regime, kind of erasure of memory there, building a memorial at a different site than the actual location of Babi Yar, about a mile away, um, also building it in a kind of, you know, Soviet realist uh, form, not identifying the Jews perished there, and of course, it is more complicated because at Babi Yar, I believe the number is perhaps 200,000 total. But the incident at Babi Yar in September, um, the, the September 28th, 29th of 1941, about 33,000 Jews were massacred, almost 34,000. But later, there were Jews who were caught in roundups, but also Soviet POWs were murdered there, and some Ukrainians were murdered there, and so there are more than one claim to memory and loss at that location. And so at this point, you have the Soviet memorial, you have Jewish memorials there, you also have, I believe, a cross there, you have a memorial to children, and so it's a contested site and also a site of kind of pluralist m memories going on. Yeah, Francesco. Yeah, a quick question on, on the role specifically of Kiev within Soviet. The role of the city in terms of Jewish memory there. One of the things I'm familiar with is that at the Vernatsky Library, the National Library there, is an important collection of ethnographic recordings, which in turn incorporates the recordings were made in the Soviet era, uh -huh. and that incorporates recordings from the from the Russia expedition of 1912. So it is, it is a site of Jewish memory and mm -hmm. Jewish archives historically. And how much do you think that? Among the paintings that we uh, acquired uh, by, by, by Strait, there's also a couple of uh, oil paintings that are essentially portraits of tombstones in Jewish cemeteries, which in itself is a way of retracing the steps of the, of the Ansky Rothschild mm -hmm. uh, ex uh, expedition, which charted mm -hmm. those same sites. So I'm wondering how much it is in the DNA of the cultural DNA of the city to actually be in charge of this type of memory work versus other other cities in the Ukraine. I'm talking about because it seems to be the site of many uh, memory uh, operations, memory related operations. 
ignored them, let's say, the Viv, which now is becoming more popular as a, as a Jewish heritage site. Right, tied to Galicia, more broadly to Galicia. That's a complicated question with a complicated answer. But what what brought you to Kiev over other like what what yeah, was yeah, yeah. So I can I can answer that too. I would say that as soon as um, as soon as photographers or artists or historians or or you know writers want to think about things like Jewish memory in Ukraine, they often move out of Kiev to look at you know. Jewish cemeteries, sort of in those areas that are sort of central Ukraine, the Shtetl, Zhitomyr, um, uh, Vinitsa, other places that are kind of, and, and also those sites that are sort of tied to the Baal Shem Tov or others, and sort of track, track, tracing that history. Um, so I think it's Ukraine and its region, and, uh, Kiev and its regions and provinces as well, that I think are part of that um, imagination. So that's just to think about, and certainly there are others, I believe, um, um, it's going to slip my mind, he was at Indiana, now he's at Michigan, who have kind of looked for traces of sort of um, the sort of Yiddish language and Shtetl Dofer Keller, and um, it'll come back to me. Oh, um, Jeffrey Weitlinger, yeah. Um, and they go, certainly are sort of taking in as a whole kind of that Ukrainian imagination um, of, of the provinces or, or those regions that had been part of the pale and, and Jewish life beyond Kiev. Kiev was a site of the sort of more elite Jewish community, city Jewish life, of those who got out of the you know the provinces and were able to come into the city, but so a site of, of, of I would say, writers and thinkers and, and the like. Um, but in terms of why I chose Kiev, there were, so initially I chose Kiev. When I went to do my, my field work on more on Holocaust memory and memorialization, I, I, I spent many months in places in the Vinitsa region, in Tulchin, a small Jewish town that has a Jewish presence called Tulchin, Mogilev Podolsky, Chernovtsi, much smaller towns um, in which uh, Jewish life is. Um, very small town, older communities, their children have largely moved either to the city or moved, uh, emigrated altogether. Um, but in Kiev, I chose it for my field work on young people because that, in terms of thinking about a place with hope for a Jewish community that could continue um, and that had a sizable population and a sizable population of young people, Kiev made much more sense than Odessa even, even though that has a historical kind of aspect for um, writers as well, but it, it didn't have a, I would say, a significant Jewish population or young population. If you think about 90,000 Jews living in Kiev at the time that I was doing my field work, that, that's not small. Um, so I was sort of looking at a place where people were looking, pa looking past, looking at sort of questions about the past and memory and consciousness and history, but also looking forward. Um, in terms of if there was going to be any kind of future for Jewish life in Ukraine, it would be in Kiev.